Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, so much to this uh, uh, Rethinking Alzheimer's Disease event, uh, which is being organized by the European Brain Council, FPA, uh, the Swedish uh, LEAF, and the Swedish Brain Foundation jointly. And uh, we are extremely pleased to have all of you here. We are, in fact, people from uh, 40 countries uh, joining us today, and I think that highlights really the importance of the topic that we are about to discuss today. Uh, so we're really grateful uh, for all of you that you uh, are able to show up. And we're also really grateful for the uh, fantastic keynote speakers and panels that we have put together. And uh, we will today have two keynote speakers and uh, we will have two panel discussions. And uh, uh, they will uh, have, but they will have half of the of the time each. And uh, uh, each panel discussion will end with uh, the opportunity for the audience to send in questions, and uh, we will uh, then post them to the uh, to the panelists. Um, I should also inform you that the event is being recorded and uh, the recording will be shared uh, afterwards. And uh, the, uh, the first sp speaker today is uh, Professor Susan Dixon. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Gothenburg, but she's also the president of the European Brain Council. And I'm very happy to, I'm not sure that that Zoom has a floor, but if it has a floor, I'm going to give it over to you, Susan, and uh, let you give your address. Thank you so much, Joachim. It's a great Thanks. pleasure to be here today. And of course, I'd like to extend with a very warm welcome for everyone uh, for joining us from these 40 countries. Wow. <laughs> it is a very important online event. So as you've heard, I'm Suzanne Dixon, and I'm president of the European Brain Council, and I I have the Swedish link, although I'm Scottish. Uh, in, I'm a professor of physiology at the University of Gothenburg. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about EBC first. It's a European Brain Council. It's a, a non-profit organization based in Brussels, and it's involved very much in, in policy, advocacy, and communication activities for almost anything happening in the brain space. Uh, we bring to the, the table diverse stakeholders, so we, we support the research community, clinicians, patients, policy makers, innovators and partners from the industry. And uh, our mission at EBC is to promote brain research uh, with the ultimate goal of improving the lives of the estimated 179 million Europeans living with brain conditions and that's mental and neurological alike. Um, of, of these, um, uh, over 7 million Europeans are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. So the burden on patients, their families, healthcare systems, and indeed society is enormous. Um, and, and it's estimated that the societal and economic cost of this disease will reach something like uh, 250 billion euros by the year 2030. So the, the European Brain Council and FPA, that's the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, are collaborating with experts from different European countries to build a interdisciplinary consensus around practical and sustainable policy responses to Alzheimer's disease that aims to improve the lives of those people living with it. And Rethinking Alzheimer's Disease, one of our current projects, we have many rethinking series, uh, but this particular project examines ways in which the Alzheimer's disease care pathway can be improved. I mean, healthcare systems in Europe currently lack the, 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 the capacity to detect, diagnose and treat Alzheimer's disease effectively. So the European Brain Council then is one of the co-organisers of this virtual event and it follows um, the launch of our white paper, uh, Rethinking Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, that's a research driven project that focuses especially on detection and diagnosis at an early stage of the disease. Um, and, and now that we see 
the emergence of uh, exciting disease modifying drugs, it's especially important to consider how prepared healthcare systems are uh, for the use of these drugs in the, in the clinic. And for this, uh, we need, of course, policy recommendations of tangible ways to improve the care pathway. Uh, folks, I wish you a great meeting um, as you share your expertise, knowledge, and consider ways in which we can really impact on the lives of those living with this disease. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so again, welcome everyone. And uh, it's time to listen to our first keynote uh, speech today, which is going to be given by Maria Cavalli. And uh, you have caregiver experience, but you're also an accomplished social entrepreneur, Maria. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing you talking about uh, the uh, living with Alzheimer's disease in a daily life. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me to this important event. Uh, I lived with Alzheimer's disease for almost all my life in my family. And uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it is really time to uh, uh, rethink Alzheimer's disease. So this is a picture of me and my father. And he wasn't even 50 years old when he got Alzheimer's. Unfortunately, I can't tell you his feelings about the diagnosis in the first few years. I was probably scared asking him. And I was a teenager and totally preoccupied with my own feelings and my own sorrow about losing my beloved father before my eyes. And... Um, the last few years, I've been a part of a project that together with patients has created an Alzheimer's guide, bringing knowledge and experiences from others for recently diagnosed. So today I want to tell you about their experiences and most importantly, I want to tell you about the needs for, of the patients for their future. For me as a caregiver, I sometimes needed a place where I could gain knowledge about my father's illness. I sometimes needed someone within the healthcare to turn to for guidance. And I needed a safe place where I could share my thoughts with other caregivers. My dad was ill for about 10 years. And after having worked in healthcare improvement in dementia care, I wanted to put my experiences as a caregiver to good use. So, I became a social entrepreneur and started a tech company that creates digital services that helps the public sector in Sweden to provide online support for caregivers. Our services and our plots, Demens Lutzen, can be found in about 10% of the Swedish municipalities. When we launched Demens Lutzen, digital for caregivers, we started getting phone calls for patients asking us, is this only for caregivers? Doesn't this exi exist for me? We heard some horrible stories. Uh, and the patient said, this demens Lutzen sounds exactly what I need. Information on what to do right now, and where to turn for help. The patients told these horrible stories about receiving the diagnosis uh, and the lack of support. One person told me that he had received a letter from the doctor stating the diagnosis, telling him also to book a new appointment in six months. No other contact. Another person told that the doctor had a phone call and in the same call, informed that he had revoked the person's driver's license. I was totally devastated, said the man to me. The lack of information was something that people who contacted us talked about. They said there was no written information, and one person specifically asked the doctor on what to read about Alzheimer's disease, got the answer from the doctor, well, I think it's better that you read nothing. 
trying to find out more on how to cope with a new situation. They tried to find online information, but were discouraged with horrible stories where caregivers wrote about losing their loved ones in the late stages of Alzheimer's. Hearing these stories, we decided this is something we have to do. Of course, the digital system can convey information. We uh, realized that we couldn't do it alone. So we contacted a few uh, organizations and experts and together we started the journey of developing the Alzheimer's Guide. In creating the content of the guide, we've done surveys, caregivers, healthcare professionals and researchers. More than 400 people has participated. And this was in 2020, during the pandemic, where we had two choices, wait, but that wasn't a choice. We needed to participants to uh, contribute, to uh, feel comfortable talking via Zoom. With a little help and support, it worked perfectly. And as the project manager of the focus group said, we were given a clear request for the content of the Alzheimer's Guide. So now let me tell you about the needs, the outcomes of the focus groups. Uh, knowledge about the disease was one thing that they all stated they wanted. Uh, more information, both verbally, but also in written form, so that you could go home and read about it. They also wanted a booked appointment with the doctor about two weeks after the diagnosis, when all the questions had become clear. And in relationships, education for family was something And of course, guidance about how to tell the children, to tell friends and neighbors. And peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, knowing that you're not alone is important. Some people in the focus group wanted to meet others in real life. And one said, I want to meet others that has the same attitudes towards living with Alzheimer's disease, it takes me a lot, lot of effort to try to stay positive. One thing is poignant. No one with this deadly disease asked for information on how to prepare to die. They all asked on advice on how to live with Alzheimer's. They wanted research-based advice on what they should eat, how best exercise, and how to decrease stress. And also, is there any apps or tech that can simplify my life? So, so these needs were the basis for the content of the Alzheimer's Guide that was launched in November last year National Guide for Patients in Sweden. And I'm very happy to say it's been very well received with fantastic feedback from the patients. And I must say, one of the success factors has been the help of a fantastic group of working patients. They helped us not only with the content, but also with the technical development. The platform is much smarter thanks to them. And that's the point I want to convey to you who are working as a decision and policymaker and a healthcare developer listening today. As we all know, the last few years, this field has not had one, but multiple groundbreaking advancements in detection, diagnostics and treatment embarking on a journey for transformation to fully embrace these innovations. Don't forget to ask and listen to the patients and their families. I'm sure that the pathway will be much smarter if it's need-based and if all stakeholders are incorporated. 
don't underestimate the patient's abilities to take part and having ideas on how they would like the care to be in the future. Don't think it's not possible, then you are making it impossible. These are all created images. This is how they all with Alzheimer's disease. And this is a photo from reality. It's Panilla, Lisbeth, Susan, Freya, women who in this picture had lived with Alzheimer's for almost three years. To fully get the advantages of early detection, the public's knowledge of early signs are important. The picture on the left cements the public's preconceived notions and is stigmatized for those affected. One important part of rethinking Alzheimer's disease is bringing knowledge and hope that with a diagnosis, care and support from the family, society and healthcare, it is possible. To fully get the advantages of early detection, public knowledge of early signs are so important. Um, and the pictures, the created pictures are preconceived uh, or are, cements the public's knowledge of preconceived notions on living with Alzheimer's disease and is stigmatizing for those affected. So one important part of rethinking Alzheimer's disease is bringing knowledge and hope that with an early diagnosis, care and support from the family, from healthcare and society, you can live with Alzheimer's disease. Thank so you for yes. <laughs> Thank you for reiterating that, Maria. That was really important. Can I yeah. just ask you one question? You said it it was the Alzheimer's guide was well, has been well received in the patient and caregiver community, but have you had any reactions from healthcare or policymakers? Uh, absolutely. Um, we have lots of um, people that meet um, people with uh, Alzheimer's in the early stages that has said this is a fantastic tool for us to show and to guide uh, people that are recently diagnosed. And uh, they're very happy to be a part and have this tool for the patients. And right. policymakers, um, well, yes, I know that our elderly care minister. We have an appointment with her in a few uh, in in a few weeks, so um, we're getting there. Fantastic, and yes, and we hope that this event will raise the interest even further. Of course, can I? Uh, it would be fantastic if you could stay for the Q and A session after the next panel discussion, Maria, and uh, uh, participants can post questions in the comments field to Maria as well. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce our first panel for today. And uh, we have three guests in that panel. It's uh, Frédéric Destrebeck, he's the executive director of the European Brain Council. And we have Linus Jönsson, a professor of health economics at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And we also have Kai Blenov, he's a professor of clinical neurochemistry at the University of uh, Gothenburg. And uh, first of all, uh, I just want to ask if you have any immediate uh, and spontaneous reactions to what you heard Maria talk about. Well, you're, you're asking me if I may, and actually I was planning to, to say that before, uh, before introducing, I'd like really to praise the testimony that she provided because this is exactly the reason why we are developing a project like Rethinking AD. Um, but it's also the, the story behind, uh, let's say, concepts and theories uh, that can only, um, that, that really brings the true value. Um, otherwise, you know, our papers are just like technical analysis and very theoretical schemes and all of that. Um, but, you know, if all recommendations weren't based on the lived experience of um, of the community that Maria represented, uh, it would really be meaningless. 
Great. And I'll Linus so Kai, if you have anything you want to add to that before we move on to the questions. Uh, I, I could just agree. Right a fantastic work that, that Maria and her team is, is doing. And, and it's, it's something that you hear all the time from patients is the, the lack of information and the difficulty in finding accurate information. I think they're doing a fantastic job on that, on that side. I agree. Great. Yes. So again, uh, I would like just to remind the uh, participants that you, if you could please write your questions for the panel and for Maria in the chat, uh, then we will get back to them uh, towards the end of the panel discussion. And uh, let me start with you, Frederick. Uh, could you please just tell us a little bit about why the Rethinking Alzheimer's Disease project was initiated by the European Brain Council? Yes, thank, thank you, Joachim. And I, I just have one slide to, to show. I'll, I'll share my screen uh, sure. for this mm -hmm. very short in, intro, hoping that uh, you can you can all see that. Yes. Um, but we... Yeah, is it appearing? Okay, that's magic. Um, so we, we heard from Professor Dixon, you know, what, what EBC was standing for and, um, you know, making sure that uh, everything around the brain and in the brain space uh, could actually be be promoted and advocated for to policymakers at the European level. But we also uh, know, see ourselves in the need to advocate at national, but also international level. Um, but the reason why Alzheimer's disease came about is because of the uh, many developments in the in the field um, and probably from the need to also uh, reconceive and restructure the way we were looking at the disease and the way the disease was being managed. Um, so this, uh, this scheme is presenting, I would say, the usual way by which uh, patients are being looked after. Uh, which is, let's say, the, the traditional ways whereby what we identified was an issue with the detection and diagnosis uh, of Alzheimer that was coming far too late, uh, and that is when symptoms were, were already uh, apparent and, uh, and in a way impossible to reverse, because we know that this is where the challenge actually lies uh, in the future therapeutic options. But um, across the board, what this um, scheme probably doesn't show is exactly what Maria was telling us, is, um, is a conception of Alzheimer's that, uh, that is probably based on stigma, um, that is also um, based on, on misperceptions um, and affecting our vision of the disease. Like, um, I mean, it is a dramatic one, but it is one that is seen where, uh, let's say, living living with the, with the disease is probably no longer seen as as something possible. So that means, uh, you know, uh, associated with decline and uh, and uh, and decrease uh, in in well being, of course. Um, there is also an issue here um, that we wanted to identify with the structural barriers um, in the system uh, that we needed to uh, to address that mainly revolved around workforce and, uh, and infrastructure. So on the basis of, uh, of our study, what we did was to conduct interviews and, uh, and analysis on the, with the support of uh, key opinion leaders. Um, many of them will be speaking uh, later today uh, in, in this event. Um, it's an opportunity for me to, to thank them uh, wholeheartedly for their contribution because uh, it's really where we we would like to flag up their contribution and make sure that we can uh, promote it to the to the best possible extent. Um, and this is how it translated basically. Uh, it is really a revised model um, that not only focused on the ways by which we should anticipate and and rethink the way by which we detect and diagnose Alzheimer's. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, but also uh, a way by which we reconsider the entire healthcare system to make sure that it would be ready to embed uh, principles and uh, and strategies around this early detection and, and diagnosis. So primarily, I should say that GPs and nurses are probably at the front line in this uh, new detection strategy, um, but we should also reconsider the way by which detection techniques are being used and are, um, let's say, entering into, into the scope uh, of, uh, of this system. So um, it revolves around uh, also the need for improved education for medical doctors, particularly GPs, revisit their medical curriculum, allowing them to have specific consultations when there is like a suspicion uh, of Alzheimer's disease and 
uh, probably go beyond the 15 minutes consultation that we usually have when we meet a doctor. Um, we also need uh, further awareness uh, for the public. Um, and all in all, what we wanted to see emerging was potentially also that each country, and hence the, the purpose of the meeting today for Sweden more specifically, um, but as part of, of EBC's um, uh, conviction, the need to develop national brain plans, and in this case, uh, with a strong focus on Alzheimer's, was, was definitely something we'd like to see emerging. Um, and it is definitely time to act for the benefit of patients and their families and carers. Uh, I could talk long about the paper that, um, that has come out in the context of this study, but I'll probably pause here um, and happy to join the, the discussion. Thank you. The paper is available for people to read at the European Brain Council's website. Uh, uh, maybe just to check with uh, Kai and Linus. Kai, the, uh, Frederick had a slide showing the what the current pa uh, pathway looks like. Do you agree? Do you think that's a, a proper description? I, I like the slide. I think it is the slide for the future. It's not the slide how it looks today, how I see it at least, because we don't have the, the biomarkers in blood available. So uh, I hope it will look like this, because uh, I, I think it's important that we start with some type of more first in line diagnostic test or you could call it a screening test and maybe the use of that is not to make a definite diagnosis but instead to triage or select patients who can be admitted to the specialist clinic or not so 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 i think uh, i agree with uh, the outline of the di diagnostic pathway mm. in that slide absolutely and uh, linus uh can I just, if we, if we take even one step further back here, can you tell us something about the, in a country like Sweden with 10 million inhabitants, what kind of numbers of people are we talking about that would potentially need a diagnosis here? Yeah, yeah. thanks Joachim for inviting me. Um, so um, in Sweden, we know that we have about 150,000 people living in the country. Um, and we know that because we've, we follow these people in, in or many of them in, in registries. When it comes to the undiagnosed those patients, of course, we don't know exactly. Um, you could guess that maybe around 100,000 patients in the earlier stages of disease are, are you know, are not, not recognized. Um, we've estimated that maybe that's the number of patients who could be eligible for a disease-modifying therapy in, in the end. But, but really, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So in to a quarter of a million people in total and maybe a hundred thousand in these early stages. Yeah. Um, and then uh, it of course starts with rec recognizing the disease and diagnosis and, and so on. And uh, a concept is the timely, the, the concept of timely diagnosis. What, what do we mean by timely diagnosis? And would everyone mean the same thing when they yeah. say that? Well, in my mind, so everyone who has symptoms of, of cognitive impairment should be offered opportunity to to have the cognition tested and 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 so forth. Um, I think it's too early to talk about screening in asymptomatic asymptomatic individuals. But if you are uh, having symptoms and you're concerned about that, I think you should have the opportunity to be diagnosed. And I think also if you have a cognitive impairment you should be offered a theological diagnosis. You should be mm -hmm. have the opportunity of having your disease kind of uh, uh, verified. So if we know if it's Alzheimer's disease or something mm -hmm. else. And just to take a step back to, to the slide that Fredrik showed, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to re remember that current guidelines in Sweden state that if you are above working age mm -hmm. and you're at the GPs and you have a cognitive impairment and it's judged that you likely have Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. the guidelines are you should not be referred to specialist care for etiological diagnosis today. That's our current mm -hmm. guidelines. So mm -hmm. we have a bit to go there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guy, uh, uh, do you agree that it's uh, with Linus? view here that you if you have symptoms you should get a diagnosis and, and why is that important i mean if you have symptoms uh, that's when you hopefully uh, uh, seek uh, medical advice maybe at a primary care unit uh, and uh, so that's the stage of course when you need the diagnostic evaluation 
which may be in primary care uh, according to current guidelines, but I think we agree here that uh, we need uh, also for the new type of treatments uh, evaluation at the specialist clinic or the memory clinic where we have other types of diagnostic tools. And uh, uh, Linus, uh, if I can ask you, you recently published an article about the gap in access to specialists in the Swedish healthcare setting. Can you just tell us a little bit about that analysis? Yeah, no, we were trying to, to think about where the bottlenecks are in the system currently. If you have a new disease modifying therapy introduced in, in Sweden, um, that of course creates a, a, an interest and imperative for, for increasing diagnostic services. And, and where would the bottlenecks appear in the system? And, and what we can conclude from that is that it's it's the access to, to specialists that's probably the most important bottleneck for us. I mean, we have in, mm -hmm. in Sweden a tradition that geriatricians, is the, that's a specialty who care for most mm -hmm. patients with um, uh, quality disorders and uh, that we only have about 600 of them in, in Sweden and they have many other things they do as, as well um, so if uh, you know if we don't do anything at the current uh, pace um, we estimate that you might have queues of several years three four years maybe at memory clinics um, to be able to to meet the, the, the demand from from diagnosis service if we want to be able to diagnose everyone like we talked about now so that that is that is the main bottleneck we have yeah and what what proportion of the patients today would get to the to the specialist setting and how are they are there any characteristics of those patients that sets them out from patients who don't get to the specialist setting yeah that's, that's a great question we have we have some information on that from the swedish dementia registry where we follow both patients in primary care and and in specialist care, of course, those who come to specialist care tend to be a little bit younger, a little bit earlier in their in their disease. Um, but actually, we 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 don't know uh, the full spectrum of everyone who is who is diagnosed in in primary care. We don't have complete data on that. We're actually trying to get that right now. So come back, mm -hmm. come back in six months or so. We might be able to answer that. that, oh, that okay. quite and okay. and in terms of what proportion is referred, we actually don't really know that either. It's it's it's. Mm -hmm. It's probably less. It's less than half. Probably far, far less than half of patients who are referred. Mm. Mm. So, Kai, do you have anything to add to that, or is it, should we consider it a so-called good question? Still, uh, I agree. I think that will be the bottleneck definitely when we have uh, the disease-modifying drugs available, for for several different uh, reasons. That's more details, maybe, but uh, of course, it's. Uh, diagnostic evaluation and also the repeated infusions that you need uh, every second week actually with these drugs and then the risk of side effects and so on that is there it's very low in my eyes but still it's there and then you maybe you need to be a specialist to really handle that in a good way isn't it uh, an interesting question of timing here. Is, is it important to have this accurate diagnosis even before we have access to the disease modifying treatments, Kai? What is your view on that? Yeah, I've been uh, arguing for that for actually something like 30 years, mm. but of course it's important because Alzheimer's disease and the other disorders that it might be like FTD or Lewy body mm. and, and many others, they are really serious diseases and of course it's important mm. that the patient should know the cause of uh, the symptoms and understand that uh, just like for any other disease uh, could be heart disease or, or cancer or whatever mm. we shouldn't treat patients with cognitive symptoms different from those with other types of symptoms mm. and and in that what what is the value of biomarker-based diagnosis? Uh, I mean, biomarker-based diagnosis will give uh, the possibility to make, a, you could call it an etiological diagnosis, meaning that you can say which disease it is, not only cognitive impairment or dementia, but you can actually say that this is AD, for example, or other diseases. And so that's the way to do it. And, and you have different 
modalities or types of biomarkers. It's both brain imaging, so it's uh, uh, CT and uh, magnetic resonance in imaging, imaging scans. It's uh, cerebrospinal fluid tests and, uh, of course, PET scans. But uh, PET scans have uh, limitations with uh, availability. You only have that at the university clinics and even there the, the availability is quite limited for this uh, massive increase in patients that we may foresee with uh, new drugs. Hmm. And uh... Uh, what? How could biomarkers, do you think, be integrated within routine clinical practice or more broadly than today? Mm, I think uh, it's uh, very similar to what Frederick showed in his uh, slide, that uh, if we start in the primary care, because that's where most patients will seek medical advice, if you there do some type of... Uh, uh, relatively brief clinical investigation, me medical history and uh, el evaluation of symptoms and neurological status. And then if you combine that with this uh, new type of blood biomarkers that uh, soon will be available in Sweden, then you have a, a first uh, uh, division or you could call triaging into patients with high risk of having Alzheimer's disease. One group where you can exclude Alzheimer's disease and, and one uh, group where you the blood biomarkers won't specifically help you. But in principle this means that each group is, is around one third and those with a clear um, uh, risk increase for having AD, that's a group of patients that you can admit to the specialist clinic where you can do the other biomarkers depending on uh, where you are. But uh, since uh, it uh, most likely will be that we need to verify that this patient has Alzheimer's disease, meaning beta amyloidosis in the brain. So this is the target for the drugs and we need to show that you have this type of pathology and then you need to do CCF tests as I see it because there you have really accurate uh, diagnostic tool to, to prove that this is Alzheimer's disease or to exclude it. Uh, Linus, it's uh, it given the, uh, the very large number of patients we are talking about potentially here, I think it would be interesting if we could know something about the cost and perhaps cost effectiveness of timely diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the cost of diagnosis is at first is a very small part of the cost of this disease. I mean, if you look at the whole medical costs of Alzheimer's disease, that is only a few percent of the cost of this disease. The most costs happen in the in the municipal care and, and informal care. <clears throat> so uh, medical costs is a very small part and, and the diagnostic cost, of course, is only a small part of that. So 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 diagnostics, you know, it's it's not from a cost perspective, mm. it's not a big problem. Um, of course, if you're going to do diagnostics, why not do it earlier rather than mm. later? used information right um of course if we go into earlier diagnosis that means we may have to test more people we'll have some false positives and so on um so of course it's important to look at the cost effectiveness of, of these new diagnostic strategies that we're thinking of it's a lot of patients and, and as, as you're saying and typically when we when we try to evaluate you know cost effectiveness of of diagnostic strategies we we tend to be quite narrow in how we how we view that we try to say well how exactly are you going to use this diagnostic information? What is the medical decision you're going to inform? Of course, if there is a new treatment out there uh, and that treatment is very cost effective, then a, a diagnostic process that help you, helps you find patients for that treatment can also then be cost effective. But again, then it depends on that, on that treatment. Um, so if, if you're very narrowly focused like that, well, then we have to look at what treatments are available, how are they priced and so on. Mm. If you're, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> now, could you please expand just briefly on the cost effectiveness of the treatments then? Because uh, I think yeah, what you're saying is maybe that that's a bigger issue 
the cost and cost effectiveness of the disease modifying treatments when they uh, will arrive. Yeah, um, so we, we've tried to look a little bit into that um, and there's still a lot of uncertainty in that. Of course, we don't know what the price will be of these, these drugs. So that's, that's, of course, an important part. Um, there is also some uncertainty about the longer term efficacy of these treatments that we don't know. But if we try to look at just what we know about them, so the trials for lecanemab and donanemab that we've, we've seen recently, um, it seemed to be that these drugs can delay the progression of the disease um, by maybe about a third. Um, and that means maybe that you're delaying progression with maybe six months or, or so. Um, so if you, if you just take that at face value and say, well, let's, let's assume we can reduce then the time in the more severe states by by six months um, that of course will lead to to cost savings uh, at the end at the later end of the, of the of the disease and also improved quality of life um, and if we compare that like to the to the cost of the the price of the drug that's been announced in the United States currently it's about uh, yeah between twenty and thirty thousand dollars per per year um, and at that price these drugs are probably not cost effective uh, in a Swedish setting. They will probably be seen to be too expensive given these uh, these medical benefits. Um, um, probably the price will have to come down. You will also have to factor in the cost of administering the treatment and the cost of monitoring for, for side effects and so on. But uh, there is a process, of course, for this for price negotiations and so on. I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we'll be able to have a, a, a good outcome of, of that in the end. Um, yeah. And if I can come back just for a second to the sure. to mm -hmm. the diagnostic uh, uh, process, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, if you're very narrowly focused on mm -hmm. selecting patients for treatment, then that's very important. But we sh we should look at diagnosis also in a, in a wider sense. I mean, there is a there is a, a value not only for the patients and caregivers of knowing their diagnosis. There is actually a value for the whole healthcare system and for research also in having patients diagnosed early. Um, it will be really important for. Uh, for us in the future to have patients identified early, so we can follow them, we can learn more about these uh, these diseases, um, and and uh, you know that's already been a, a big source of information, um, and that's that enables us to develop uh, new medicines in the future. So there's there are many reasons, as, as Kai said, for 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 early diagnosis. Thanks, uh, Frederick. Uh, I want to ask you, you. These are some really uh, uh, big and important topics, and uh, you have. This is what you have, you have dialogue with decision makers about these di different topics. And wh what is it that you hope to achieve through these dialogues, these ongoing dialogues around this, these topics? Yeah, I think uh, here, Joachim, the, the, the question is, um, I mean, it's simple and complex at the same time, mm -hmm. um, because what we would like to achieve is indeed a greater recognition of the impact of the disease and you know what needs to to be done i mean i've i've already uh, put a few uh, a few points down of what can be done very concretely particularly what linus was saying in terms of the clinical guidelines and let's say one or two changes about like the the current situation in the sense that the the current inaction hurts and hurts um you know people living with the disease and their, and their families as we were saying earlier so there would be, uh, I would say, these very concrete outcomes at the at the local or, or national level. But I think that you know, from EBC perspective, uh, making sure that we can uh, learn from what is being done locally or nationally, and uh, be able to exchange good practices, so that any improvements um, within the EU, because Europe is all jurisdiction, but I would say across the board, um, can be learned about and create a, a kind of uh, positive spillover effects in other countries. So that has always been, let's say, the, the strategy when it comes to uh, to healthcare matters uh, at an EU level. Um, but when it comes to, to our work and making sure that policymakers pay attention to that, I mean, there is not only what Linus and Kai were, were illustrating and, and also Maria, but uh, I, I quite like the point being done about cost effectiveness or, or, or cost saving. Um, this is, I would say, a tactic that we have been using uh, over the years uh, with EBC producing cost and burden study about the, like the cost of brain disorders on a yearly basis in the EU and so on and so forth. Um, plus then uh, work being done on the, on the recognition that any investment into uh, our healthcare system should not be seen as a cost. 
but as a true investment on which we yield a return because societally not investing would be even worse. So we had this study on the value of treatment, which by the way, is at the basis of, uh, of our rethinking series. So all of that, let's say being complemented um, and, and building incrementally one, one upon the other. But the true demonstration is that any investment into improved patient outcomes bears a benefit societally and economically. And I believe this is really the, the sense and the merit of what we should know, um, let's say, use as a data, but also then to come up with the expertise of, um, of, um, of clinicians like Linus and Kai, of researchers, but also uh, of, uh, of patients. I want to ask all of you actually uh, one question, and that's: Do we do you think we need a national plan for early detection, detection and diagnosis to move this work forward? Kai, what do you what is your view? Uh, I think that would be good to have definitely, so that it's uh, done in a standardized way, and also that we monitor the the effect of treatments in a, in a standardized way. Definitely. So I think that would be good. And uh, Friedrich, is that something that you are pushing for all countries to have a national plan for early detection and diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. I was about to say I've got a vested interest here because EBC has been advocating for, you know, the adoption of national brain plans since a couple of years. Um, not only because we saw the value, and as I said earlier, of the complementarity between EU action and, and national action, it's, I would say, the DNA of the, the decision making at European level, um, but also because more importantly, last year, the WHO has adopted the Global Action Plan um, on epilepsy and neurological disorders, um, which means that now every country has a duty to respond to the WHO by 2030. As to how it will meet uh, the objectives of that uh, of that global plan, so coming up with a national plan is no not even in 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 question. the The issue is like how can we make sure that this plan contains the holistic and inclusive vision of what we need uh, in order to tackle brain disorders and address mm -hmm. issues that you know revolve in the research sector, uh, the healthcare sector, but also more broadly. Uh, how it impacts society. This is definitely what DBC has been defending for a couple of years. Um, to follow examples of other disease areas and other, let's say, advocacy group, cancer, not to name it, um, which has been, let's say, very successful in in running this this type of agenda, and we would like to be to be able to do the same um, in in uh, in the near future. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, a final question before we move on to the questions from the audience and. Uh, that is, what do you see as the most urgent action to take now? Linus, would you yeah. like to start? Yeah, thanks. So so just to uh, also comment on the national mm -hmm. plan, it kind of links to that. So so I, I agree with Kai that, you know, we have this uh, reason to believe that, you know, we will have big disparities across, across Sweden uh, in access. We already have that. So equalizing that is really important. Even more, I think Sweden has a real opportunity to really lead the way here. Sweden's already a leader in the use of uh, biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease diagnostics, thanks to Kai and his research and, and many others. Um, and we have the opportunity to also be a leader in uh, developing knowledge about the new generation of disease-modifying therapies. We have fantastic registry infrastructure. We have everything you need to do this, but we also need we need more resources, more investment in that. And if, for me, that's actually the most urgent thing these new drugs that we are seeing to the market now is a fantastic step forward, but they are not the solution in the end. We need more research. We need better and more drugs in this area. The most urgent thing is to now invest in research, make sure that patients are diagnosed and are able to be included in research studies so we can we can develop also the next generation of, of drugs. That's for me is the most urgent. Mm -hmm. Kai, what is your take, the most urgent action to take now? Yeah, I first of all, I agree with what Linus said. Uh, my view is that uh, a very important issue, and this is already said, of course, is education. Uh, and that we need uh, to educate the, I mean, elderly people about symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, when to uh, seek medical advice, what to 
till the primary care or this, uh, physicians. Uh, of course, we also need uh, to uh, educate uh, the primary care physicians if they don't do it themselves. Uh, I mean, if you if you work with this group of patients as, as they do, and there comes a new drug, of course, they uh, in the interest of their own, uh, yeah knowledge and how you treat patients in the best way that they should read up a bit on Alzheimer's disease and this new drug, of course, and the diagnostic pathway. But in, in the end, I think what we really need is to have more specialists. I think we need more resources at the memory clinics and uh, more doctors, of course, more nurses also for the, I mean, infusions and, and all the evaluations you do on. But so to me, number one is actually the memory clinics so to increase the capacity there and the number of specialists. Thank you. That's a fantastic bridge to the second half of this webinar, <laughs> which will be about the health system readiness. <laughs> uh, Frederick, do you want to add anything to uh, your earlier comments about uh, what should be done now? Well, actually, uh, I, I had one immediate thought, and it's building on on Maria's conclusion, uh, basically on the message of hope. Uh, but message of hope that I would like to base also on the need to mm. um, to address the stigma around the disease, and I think she she really demonstrated that uh, brilliantly. And the best ways in, in, in my view to do that is just to make sure that we demystify the magic uh, behind the brain. And, um, you know, for far too long, we have been uh, saying that brain science was too complex, that there was too much uncertainty, that we would never have a cure and whatsoever. And now this needs to end. Our narrative needs to change. We need to emphasize the positive. And we need really to um, showcase and celebrate the success of science. Um, I mean, this is something that no EBC we are committed to 100%. And this is definitely a message uh, of positivity that I would like to, uh, to, to share in conclusion. Thank you. Uh, and now there, it's no surprise to me that we could spend a long time asking Maria questions from the audience. <laughs> so Maria, are you prepared? We'll have a, a, a couple of ones for you. And uh, okay. yes, so um, one question is if the platform is available in different languages. As I said, we have 40 different countries here today. So uh, that's a good question. Sorry, could you repeat that? My is, the, is the platform available in different languages or just Swedish? Um, for now, it's just in Swedish, but it's um, adaptable, so it's easily um, translatable. And I think most of the information is universal, like the experiences of patients. Uh, that is easily uh, translatable so just contact me and uh, we'll facilitate in other languages yes you all heard that uh, so uh, you can contact maria regarding that question and uh, one more about the uh, platform that it's regarding uh, the patient's attitude and aptitude to use this platform is it difficult are they positive do they need assistance things like that? Well, in general, I would say uh, there's a very positive attitude. And in Sweden, we have a high degree of uh, digital maturity uh, among older individuals. If we're looking at that target group. Mm. And, and also, that's who we are targeting, people early in their disease and also who use technology in their everyday life. Many patients say that their phone is their mo most important tool in their life uh, with the reminders and stuff like that. But I would say uh, since using or having the help of a working patients group, this platform is very adapted to their needs and uh, intuitive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I want to em emphasize that Tech can never replace uh, the contact with healthcare. And I do believe, as uh, Kai just said, 
we need more doctors, we need more specialists, we need more nurses. Um, uh, but this is a perfect complement tech is and conveying uh, other people's experiences and uh, knowledge when the patient is at home. Because that that's it, it. This is another question that has come up. That uh, it is regarding the professional shortages and uh, what is the best way to address that, given that it actually takes quite a long time to train, for example, a geriatrician. Are there other specialists or other, could you use nurses or what, what, what are the paths forward? I'm not sure if Linus or uh, Kai wants to start. Yeah, I, I, I could uh, mm -hmm. give a shot. This is a difficult mm -hmm. one. I don't think I have a, a clear, clear solution to it. I think there are a couple of things you can try. I mean, there has been the concept of infusion clinics that's been used in oncology in some countries. Um, and we could look at look into that. So that would, you know, at least free up the resources that would otherwise you need to have at the memory clinic for, for actually administering the drug. Uh, so that's one thing. I, I think we will also need, um, you know, other specialties other than neurologists will have to, you know, step in at least in the short term. I, I don't really see the other another uh, way of, of dealing with this. Um, you know, neurologists and others who are interested in this field uh, to to step in and, and help. Um, and of course, uh, you know, improving the the filter, if you will, at the, at the primary care level to make sure that it's really the right ones who are the right patients who are, who are referred on to to specialist care. I think those are all all all, all pieces we have to work with. Mm. Kai, do you want to add to that? Maybe I would like to add this, that it will take uh, time to to train or educate a fully trained uh, specialist in, in memory disorders and, and experienced nurses. But number one is to, to have uh, positions available at, at the memory clinics so that you have uh, new services for for young doctors who, who for sure will be interested in, to work in this uh, exciting area now with the new drugs uh, and the possibility to diagnose the disease and everything. So I think in the end it will depend on the politicians that they uh, add on money for this purpose. Hmm. Can, um, I'm going to let Maria in, but first I'm going to ask Kai uh, a question that Maria wants to pick up on maybe too, uh, and that is from the audience. Can family members help detect Alzheimer's disease? Uh, I think that is hard. I mean, of course, just to try to uh, explain or write down the symptoms and, and how long it has lasted and so on when they come to the visit to the doctor but but not really so much more not as i see it mm. uh, maria final word to you actually of this panel Go oh, ahead. um well i just want to pick up on what kai and linus just said that i think that changing the image of Alzheimer's disease and the new innovations that are available. I think that will attract hopefully more people, uh, specialists to this field, but we need finances. So we need the politicians to see this and, and make the decisions about that. Uh, yeah. And I do think that caregivers can be a part of seeing early detections, uh, early signs, but they also need information and support on how to to where to turn in healthcare with that i'm going to say thank you to this panel it's been enormously interesting and uh, now we're going to move forward to the second half of this webinar and we will talk about the healthcare system transformation and scaling up health system readiness uh, and uh, to introduce this topic, we have the great honor of having Mova Vibon on board, and uh, she will give uh, a keynote speech talking about how we can rethink the Alzheimer's care pathway in Sweden. And Mova is a senior physician and senior manager at the Engelholm Hospital in Sweden. So go ahead, Mova. Thank you. Here to to. Um... Uh, Claire, uh, make clear what you already said. I think it's amazing uh, in your uh, 
uh, what you've been discussing in the panel uh, is about uh, the same that I'm going to say. So I'm starting with a picture with me on a, a big Swedish television show. So I call myself uh, famous because I'm famous am among the, those million people, those one million people in Sweden, plus 65 uh, years old. Uh, they watch Fråga Doktorn or Ask the uh, Doctor. And my point with this is uh, mostly uh, getting out there and talking about uh, the diseases of the brain and most specifically the neurocognitive disorders and making it easy to understand. That's uh, one of uh, our biggest tasks, I think. Uh, and also uh, switching the idea from dementia towards living with the disease. So, uh, and just to clarify, uh, I'm a GP, uh, so it's easy to get in, but you have to work for a few years to get that experience needed. But we can use neurologists, uh, GPs, geriatrics, psychiatrists, anyone, uh, really. It's just get in here and get to work. So, uh, just to start with, we already discussed where we are. Uh, when you have the cognitive decline and uh, to make you all uh, think about it just for a second, we have the attention, we have the executive function, we have the memory, we have the language, we have the orientation and the social skills. So much needed. When something is missing, you go to your GP and the GP does the, base, the, the most uh, easy investigation just to, to check on your blood and just, just to check with the CT that there's not a brain tumor or there's something else uh, in the uh, making uh, giving you those symptoms and when that is done uh, maybe there are uh, these uh, five neurocognitive disorders left and it's not easy for the GP to go further we need the cerebrospinal fluid or we need the pet or we need the experience to discuss and maybe find the other uh, diseases that are um, making us a bit uh, that are more difficult so um, what are the expectations from the patient when they do arrive from the GP to my clinic here cognitive medicine in Engelholm uh, these are the expectations when I do uh, uh, deliver the result from my investigation that uh, the results uh, tell me that you could have Alzheimer's disease. Every person wants to have the SWAT team or the uh, trauma team. They want, please help me, my brain cells are dying. So uh, this is not what they get, get today. Today they get, uh, hopefully, Alzheimer's guidance. Uh, but uh, sometimes they don't even get uh, a, 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 um, another appointment until six months later. So that's really not a comfortable way of working when you're working with persons in need. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, Nurse Malin. This is Nurse Malin. Uh, she's a superstar because she's been working for more than 10 years in the neurology se section with uh, antibody treatment uh, to uh, multi multiple sclerosis patients. So last year we had the opportunity to give three doses of aducanumab. And Malin was the superhero here, so she, uh, she just fi fixed it. It was easy. We know how to do it. It's really not a problem. Uh, but in order to give more uh, of the uh, citizens in the north of Skåne. We have around 300,000 inhabitants in our area. Uh, I would use uh, a few more of the Malins, maybe some more. No, I need very many Malins. I think even this many Malins. Uh, no problem, they're out there. It's just, uh, it's, uh, we just need the resources. We just need to rethink. So this is how it works today. <clears throat> the uh, path through our uh, clinic, uh, we have the referral and we accept it. And then there's a wait. And the wait could be as long as 12 months, some even more. But uh, mostly 
about 50% of those uh, people getting a referral to our unit, uh, they uh, come to us within five months. So we're trying to speed up, but we're not enough persons. And then we have the uh, physician meeting and doing the standard procedure and the cognitive testing at the same time. And then we do the CSF uh, samples with the lumbar puncture. And then we have the MRI or the neuropsychiatric inventory or, or neuropsychiatric testing. And we have the PET. But I've made a point. The most important thing is the time when I, as a physician, have uh, the diagnose ready if I have because sometimes it's too difficult but then even then it's so important that I have the discussion with the patient uh, so we can never take that away never ever ever take that away it's the most important uh, and, and, and I have as, as a manager for this clinic it's my duty to make sure that my staff have that time and have that secluded that moment together in order to make it as as uh, gentle and as uh, positive as possible uh, and then it's time for treatment so uh, when uh, Joachim asked me to have this uh, talk he said just go ahead just think whatever rethink and this is the best I can get <laughs> I don't think I should rethink I don't think it's my position to rethink. I think it's time for the society to rethink. Because just as you've already said, we should not do any shortcuts in this area uh, just because there are too many. Um, that's really dangerous way of walking. We need to, to give this time and we need to give it competence. Uh, so I think maybe we could uh, do some easier path when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. And to just finally uh, talk to you about this is uh, not the whole staff, but almost the whole uh, gang, my superheroes, uh, my amazing crew. Um, I see three obstacles in the future. As you already said, there's a lack of knowledge in society. So, yeah. Uh, uh, there's about around 20,000 Swedes uh, having a diagnosis of neurocognitive disorder every year, but there are also 24,000 heart attacks. And if you compare that, you can see the different allocations of the resources. And it's, uh, it's just, uh, uh, it makes me uh, really mad, actually. Um, and then there, there's the second one is a large patient court. Yes. But should they be punished because of that? Should we, when I get Alzheimer's in a few years? I don't know, but I could. Should I be punished because I'm too many? There's too many of us? I don't think so. Uh, and then the most important for me as a manager, I say the challenging diagnostic considerations. Are there enough competence? And with this, I want to talk to all those four countries listening and saying, we are here, we are ready. We are even um, uh, been appointed to uh, do our own thing. We have a, 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 the staff is uh, running our clinic. So uh, we are ready to help out with the competence. We, can, uh, we are here to serve you with uh, knowledge. So we have started to have some, some uh, uh, education and we are, happily to, we are happy to, to speed things up. And I have a queue to start working here. I just miss the resources. So my last line is, we have one significant facilitator. We have our Swedish law. And the law says it's equal care to all citizens and those with greater need shall be given priority. It's time for Alzheimer's. Thank you. Thank you, Moa. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, it would be also fantastic if you have the chance to stay and perhaps take some questions towards the end of the panel. Uh, so I want to welcome the next, our second panel uh, today, and uh, uh, we have four guests. It's uh, Laura Campo, she's the Executive Director of International Corporate Affairs, Alzheimer's Disease for Eli Lilly. 
Uh, we have uh, Giovanni Frisoni, and he's a professor of clinical neuroscience at the Geneva University Hospital. And we have Lina Nordqvist, member of the parliament for the Swedish Liberal Party, and Jad Lerfors. Uh, she's a, the chairwoman of the New Therapies Council at the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. Welcome, all of you. Uh, again, any spontaneous reactions to Moa's uh, presentation that we just heard? Uh, otherwise, uh, let's start uh, with you, Laura. We start from the global perspective, which is really interesting. And with your global role, do you see any significant variations in countries' readiness and approach? to ensure that patients are diagnosed early enough to benefit from innovative treatments. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim, and thank you for having me. <clears throat> to go back to Mo Moa's presentation, mm -hmm. excuse me, I uh, love the way she described mm -hmm. the patient pathway. Um, mm -hmm. That's certainly um, a journey that a person with Alzheimer's disease with their family uh, go through uh, when they start to uh, notice the first symptoms and then uh, they uh, need to find uh, their way to navigate the healthcare system. To respond to your question, uh, you know, the Swedish situation is probably uh, very well versed. We have seen countries uh, uh, now that we are starting to work and uh, uh, trying to understand how the pathway works in different countries. We have seen countries that uh, are uh, much behind. And if you break the pathway, as Moa did uh, very nicely, uh, into the detection piece, so time from uh, the uh, first symptoms uh, to the, to uh, when you go to the GP and uh, um, uh, you start uh, claiming that you have problems, there are variabilities. Uh, we have seen uh, an average uh, of uh, um, 2.1 year, if I if I recall, and uh, in Italy, for example, is 1.6 years. Uh, one year, it's almost two years that uh, basically uh, people lose uh, um, uh, in uh, in their journey uh, when they could reach uh, a clear understanding of uh, uh, what that uh, uh, issues are, those issues are. Uh, if you talk about uh, diagnostic, so the uh, time when uh, the person gets uh, at the um, specialist office, uh, again, there are variabilities uh, across countries. Uh, about variabilities about uh, uh, the approach to the diagnosis, uh, but also um, variabilities in terms of infrastructure. So there are two levels of uh, uh, gaps, uh, the way uh, we have seen, and I, um, and I see it. Uh, there is a knowledge and understanding uh, of standardized approach to diagnosis. Uh, and from the other side, uh, there is uh, infrastructure. So where people go, you know, we have seen beautiful pictures from uh, Moa, uh, mm -hmm. a great, uh, hero um, uh, team, this doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, there are um, memory clinics uh, that uh, are really um, uh, understaffed. And we know that uh, in, in Sweden, for example, uh, the issue is uh, um, one of the issues that has been uh, identified is the number of uh, neurologists or specialists that can do diagnosis. Uh, but this is, uh, again, uh, replicated in other countries. But also, uh, you know, when we start talking about uh, geographically where people can go, rural areas versus uh, um, cities uh, where you have memory clinics where people can uh, can actually go, and the access uh, to diagnostic tools like PET and CSF uh, is diverse uh, across different countries. Uh, Linus talked about uh, the um, uh, the Swedish uh, data uh, and. Uh, we have seen uh, similar um, disparities uh, in, uh, um, in other countries. And then uh, the last uh, piece is around uh, yeah, the um, capacity and reimbursement again of the diagnostics. So all in all, uh, to respond to your question, yes, there are disparities. The hope is that as we move forward, uh, GPs and uh, neurologists will be equipped with the right tools uh, to ensure that this uh, time, uh, um, you know, really is shortened and people get uh, quicker to the uh, opportunity of uh, new uh, treatment or disease modifiers. Okay. 
Thank you. And um, I would like to turn to uh, Giovanni. Could you please help us bridge back to the uh, last panel discussion we had and tell us your view maybe on the opportunities for healthcare systems with different diagnostic tools that are available or under development like CSF or PET or MRI or blood? Yeah, uh, thank you, Joachim, for inviting me for, uh, for this uh, uh, stimulating question. I fully agree with Lara when she says that there are huge, uh, there's a huge, heterogene, huge heterogeneity in Europe. And even within, within a given country, among different memory clinics, there's a huge variability on the use of uh, diagnostic tools, TSF, PET, MRI. Uh, now we have an opportunity. Uh, disease modifiers will require a harmonization because there will be no, no more discussion on uh, how useful is it to have an accurate diagnosis. These discussions will be over or almost over. There will always be someone who, who wants to discuss it, but uh, the, uh, the, there will be uh, a pressure from society, from patients, to have an etiologic diagnosis. Uh, we have developed in, um, uh, together with a, uh, 11 uh, society, scientific societies and associations, uh, European societies and associations, we have developed a, a workflow, a diagnostic workflow algorithm to harmonize the use of uh, biomarkers in memory clinics according to the clinical presentation. This is uh, one uh, a, a, an effort that uh, can be a, a resource that can be used uh, by memory clinics in the future to uh, streamline the diagnosis, the patient journey, and to make it more uh, less heterogeneous within country and across countries. Hmm. And can you say something about how these capabilities should be implemented, or perhaps should we talk about being scaled up? How should that be done? Now, uh, I believe that the, the future of, uh, of diagnosis will need to be, as I said, will need to be developed around treatment. Uh, what, what will happen in, in Europe when uh, the monoclonal antibodies will be available is a revolution. We will need to change radically the way we uh, the, the, to, to radically change patient journeys. Uh, what we need uh, to do is to have uh, registries. Mm -hmm. um, I believe this, uh, this rings a bell to MOA. MOA has, been, uh, has launched a, a registry on uh, behavioral and psychological disturbances of dementia. But uh, what I believe we need to do uh, in, uh, in all European countries is to make a survey, a, uh, uh, a, 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 a full survey of patients who attend a memory clinic to understand, to, uh, to have a, a clear view of the clinical profiles of how many these patients are and the clinical profiles. Why is that so? Because the, uh, we will not be, when, monoclonal antibodies come into the market, we will not be able to, to offer them to every patient with Alzheimer's disease. That's clear. That will be impossible. So what do you want to know? You want to optimize, you want to offer your treatment solution only to those patients who are more likely to benefit and to have the lowest uh, uh, adverse effect. How can you do that? Well, the first uh, information that you need is to know, to have a, a profiling, a clinical profiling of the patient population attending a memory clinic. How do you call that? That's a registry. Mm -hmm. so this is the 
urgency number one. And we need that. In, we need to develop that in one year from now, because in probably around one year from now, monoclonal antibodies will be, uh, will be available. And the, the other thing that you want, that we want to do, that will help to, to, uh, to scale uh, diagnostic resources is to, to make modeling. For, what, what do we mean by that? Well, let's imagine that uh, we restrict the uh, monoclonal antibodies to those who are below a certain age within a given window of mini mental state, for instance, and uh, with uh, a uh, given profile of, uh, of, of somatic health. How many will they be? And what if we decrease the, the mini mental state window? How many will they be? This, is, uh, this will allow to model the number of, of potential candidates, and that will help us uh, scale our diagnostic, uh, the, the diagnostic uh, armamentarium that we will need to put in place and the personnel as well and the, and, and the, the spaces and everything that comes with, uh, with delivering uh, monoclonal antibodies to a large number of patients. Thank you. Uh, let's move a little bit towards the more uh, specific Swedish situation. I, I want to start by uh, asking you, Jad, maybe to briefly explain to us and the listeners the, the Swedish system for horizon scanning and introduction of new medicine so that they mm. all uh, are oh. more aware. I know uh, that you might have a slide that you want to show for that. Yes, yes. Your, from your own uh, computer. So thank you very much for... Mm -hmm giving me the opportunity for the, uh, the invitation to present uh, uh, our Swedish system. And I will try to share this slide that I have. Beautiful. Uh, 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 yes, I would like to present our Swedish system uh, for uh, orderly introduction of new therapies and the anti council. And I am the chair of the anti council that stands for the Council of New Therapies in Sweden. And our system for uh, uh, or this order, the joint assess introduction of new therapies is uh, a regional cooperation, and all regions are included throughout the whole process. And it's important uh, to give us input when in our decisions. Uh, the work starts with our horizon scanning, and. Um, uh, the horizon scanning is uh, a process where new therapies are identified and the aim of this work is to gather documents and information as early as possible for new therapies and uh, before it's one to two years before they are granted the marketing authorizations. This information gives the early reports is coming one to two years before market authorization. And that's one part. This is an important process to get to, for the regions to get information and preparing their healthcare for the new treatments that we see coming. And this early report is also important, is important for the anti council in the decision of uh, our joint uh, introduction. When the new treatment has, when we have a positive opinion from CHMP about the new treatment, we will ask our dental and uh, dental and um, pharmaceutical benefits agency TLV for a health economic assessment report, and TLV asks the company to give them information and economical uh, uh, economical uh, assessment. Uh, the cost per quality adjusted life years and the magnitude of the effect are important information from that HTA report and for our recommendations. Uh, we include aspects such as the magnitude of uncertainty 
in the HDA analysis and ethical considerations such as the severity and the rareness of a disease. These ethical aspects will uh, be important when we assess and when we estimate our willingness to pay. The joint introduction also includes teams for negotiations and procurements. And uh, we also have uh, uh, co-workers that work with follow-up and recommendations and to introduct in the introduction process. I think I will st stop here if there is any questions about the process. Yeah, thank you. Have you. Any more? Sorry. Now, referring back to what Laura mentioned, uh, it's perhaps relevant to ask if the same pathway is used for the introduction of new diagnostics. Yes, we have uh, the same sister. We have a medical MTP council, what we call MedTech council. But I think they have difficulty. That's a very new process. So they haven't been working with this for so many years. And it's... Uh, uh, a challenging area, I would say. And so I think that most of the new diagnostic and the introduction of those methods uh, will be uh, locally uh, and mostly at the clinicals at university hospitals. Hmm. So uh, we don't have a managed introduction in the same way for all hmm. diagnostic tools, hmm. unfortunately. Hmm. And another question that might be difficult to address for you is, do you already now see any particular challenges with the new disease modifying agents that are probably coming to market? We have discussed some of the characteristics. Yes, of course, it, it will be challenging. And I heard that it has been mentioned both the, the resources for diagnostics and for personnel and specialists in neurology and neuroradiology, but also uh, there will be an economical challenge because we, we don't yet know the price of the new therapies, of course, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just, it's, it's difficult when you have uh, so many patients uh, that in, are in need and the priori prioritizations process will be very important hmm. for this. So that's um, the, the lack of personnel and competence and uh, the, so many patients in need will be a challenge for the regions, regions yes. Because I guess that gets back to what Mova said that should they, if she would get uh, dis the disease, should she be prioritized less because there are more patients like that? Or is it, uh, is it for practical purposes you're talking? How, uh, it's what? practical purposes. We don't uh, decrease our willingness to share for mm. uh, treatments with a lot of patients. It's, we only increase it when we have few rare, rare diseases so that we don't have any any uh, process that uh, gives a less chance for many patients to to get new treatments mm -hmm. so that's uh, not according to our ethical platform Th um, thank you so much Jad. i think this uh, for a, a really good introduction to the swedish system which is a bit uh, particular <laughs> in comparison with, yes. with other countries and one Part of that I want to ask uh, Lena about. So this actually, uh, so yeah, actually highlights that we have, I think, a very decentralized system with autonomous regions, and uh, we still have uh, um, a national state that has the overriding, of course, responsibility for things like healthcare and so on. But what Lena do you see as benefits and perhaps challenges with the decentralized healthcare system that that we have when it comes to achieving better care for uh, uh, or achieving a better pathway in Alzheimer's disease. Well, I think our system could work well if we turned it 
upside down, so to speak. Uh, if we on a national level uh, decided what's good for a patient, um, what kind of knowledge uh, do they need to meet when they don't feel well, what kind of uh, diagnostics uh, need to be there wherever you live in the country, uh, what kind of treatments uh, should there be when I feel in a specific way and so, and so on. Um, but then when it comes to the regions in different parts of Sweden, I think it makes sense to say that in some regions you need to organize how this is done in a different way because we have well vast areas where almost nobody lives and we have areas where it's very densely populated um so i think it, it, it makes sense that well teams for instance or if you organize things in houses and well that kind of sort of uh, the operative parts uh makes sense to have decentralized but the way we do it now we do it the other way around so we let the regions decide on specific treatments. Um, we have recommendations, but the regions can override them uh, and do things in another way. And then the state uh, in Sweden, in my opinion, backseat drives everything, trying to say, but if you get money for this, then you can do it another way, can't you? Um, so I'd say it, it's okay to have a joint responsibility, but then we need to do it the other way around. The strategies and the way our body bodies work they need to be on a national level, whereas the sort of everyday life and the operative parts, uh, they could be on on a regional level. Thanks, and and we have and we have the system that we have now. Even though there is a commission currently looking at whether we should uh, change that, but given that we have uh, the system, we do. How how do you see that the national parliament where you is is a we are a member that you could help scale up healthcare system readiness and how to integrate new technologies for uh, both diagnosis and treatment in Alzheimer's disease. What is your role in this? Oh, how many hours do I have? <laughs> well, let, I'll, I'll try to stick to four things. Let's see now if I can manage that. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing is what Mua brought up, uh, the priorities. I think we have very good priorities in Sweden, but uh, I'm convinced we need to deepen the interpretation of them. What does it mean uh, that the, the patient in most need should get healthcare first? What is in most need? Does that mean that rehabilitation is not important? Does that mean that before your, your illness is really, really advanced and progressed, it's not uh, a priority? Um, so we... We, we need to clarify what we mean by by our priorities, because I think they're good, but they're also kind of, it, it's difficult to know sometimes what they actually mean. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, I think that we need to focus on the infrastructure. We need to make sure there's, um, I wasn't the first to say that today either, but we need to make sure that health registers, uh, health data, that they really, that they're really used, uh, that people put data in there uh, including patients, I think, in the long run, and that you also get data out, analyze it, um, that healthcare as well as um, pharmaceutical industry can get ag aggregated data and to know what to do better in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, infrastructure, so that working in healthcare is not a time travel backwards every day. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a problem too. Um, third thing, what should I take now? I think is the healthcare as an employer. Mm. Um, we, we're not good enough today in Sweden to make people want to stay, uh, to give them enough possibilities to develop, get continuous medical education, do research if they're interested in that, have time enough for their patients. Um, and, and anyone who's a recent graduate would need somebody very experienced to lean on in the beginning and experienced people need each other to lean on so then we can't have we, we can't allow people to quit basically mm -hmm. and then number four i think i promised only to say four things mm -hmm. um i would say that we we forget uh relatives today uh and with all chronic diseases and possibly especially with alzheimer's and uh, dementia of different kinds uh these the relatives they they carry quite a big burden and they're very very affected 
uh, by uh, what's happening in their family and to their, the people they really love. Uh, and we tend to forget um, about the relatives. So we need to do a lot there, I'd say, to make them be part of it, to make them be, be able to support um, without themselves becoming patients. Mm. I'll stop there, I think. Thank you. Now, those are four excellent points. And uh, thinking about your point number three and four about the uh, uh, people who work in healthcare and the patients and caregivers and give them support. How how d can you be, uh, what do you see that the parliament can do about this, given, for example, that it's not the parliament or the state that um, that are, that employs healthcare workers? No, but the parliament and the state can say that it's a legal obligation to, to give continuous magical, magical education uh, to everyone all through, through their working life and say that it's a right to get it. Um, and also the parliament can say that we need uh, big funding of inf infrastructure. We want you to feel that all infrastructure makes life easier for you. Uh, these are tools that must be used as tools, not as obstacles that you need to get through on your way to the patient. So we can do loads of things. Uh, and we can also say that the recommendations when it comes to, in this case, Alzheimer's disease, uh, they're not something that it's not just something you, you could do if you like it. Uh, this, sh this this is the law. This is how you should treat people. This is something people, patients are in, entitled to. And I think that would be a very good thing to hold on to um, if you're staff in healthcare, knowing that my patients have rights uh, and that means I, I'm entitled to offer them the best treatment possible. Yeah. Giovanni, for example, you, you heard Lina here talk about the Swedish perspective, but I guess uh, it could be relevant in a lot of settings about patient rights, for example. Uh, do you think that is um, uh, the right way to uh, move forward? Yes, absolutely. Uh, offering, you know, offering the best care to patients uh, is a uh, is a no-brainer. Uh, what I'm uh, what I'm afraid of uh, that might happen in the future is that we're not avail we're not able to manage expectations. Mm. Uh, the these monoclonal new new treatments uh, are raising great expectations. Uh, there's a, there's people who are skeptical, uh, but there's also those who have great expectations. We should be able to manage expectations to make people understand that the to 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 communicate what is realistic to expect from this treatment, which is uh, uh, which is not going to be a, an easy task, because we the, these drugs are supposed to decrease disease progression. This means that patients and relatives uh, will not see a, a halt of the disease. It will be, it, in the ma majority of cases, it will be imperceptible. So they will need to trust the doctors. They will need to trust the science. There's one uh, leverage that we can have, which is uh, showing the decrease of amyloid load. Uh, amyloid pet, plenty of amyloid before treatment and no amyloid after the treatment. This is something that will persuade people of the efficacy. But clinically, uh, a, we will need to work really hard on managing expectations and to, uh, to start slowly. The other concern uh, that I have is that memory clinics uh, may be uh, may see a deluge of patients uh, wishing to be to receive treatment. That would be a great mistake. Uh, it would be a great mistake because it's a new tool. It's a it's a new instrument, a therapeutic instrument that we started to use. We should start using slowly. Uh, to uh, to get familiarity with the tool, uh, and I believe that under that respect, uh, we should build uh, 
a, uh, a partnership with society. We should explain society. They, they should not wait, they, they should not expect to find treatment for everyone overnight. Uh, let's build a partnership with society and tell them, listen, we have a new treatment. It can be potentially, it can be very useful for you guys, but it's, we, it's like when you have a new car. You're not heading, you, you, you don't uh, start from, for a uh, 3,000 kilometer journey when you have a brand new car. You start using it uh, in, 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 the, in your sub, in your surroundings first. This is what we doctors want to do because we don't, the, the, our first uh, concern is your safety. So be patient. Treatment for everyone will come, but not overnight. Mm. I believe it, this is a, it, it's a difficult message to deliver, but I'm optimistic. I believe that society and citizens are much more uh, uh, much more intelligent than we sometimes believe they are. Thank you, Giovanni. That's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you're optimistic. I want, that's a really interesting question. And Laura, I want to ask you, the, can the industry, do you think, help us to manage expectations and go slowly? Is, that's a very is, good is point. This in your, <laughs> is this in your interest uh, as uh -huh. well? The interest uh, is definitely to ensure that uh, the right patient, the right person uh, receives the right treatment at the right time. And the core of the discussion today on the diagnostic pathway is a clear response mm -hmm. of what needs to be done. I heard Gerd talking about, you know, uh, how can we receive all these patients? Uh, and also uh, Giovanni saying the same thing. I think... Uh, enabling a, a diagnostic pathway that really will um, be able to select uh, and to uh, accurately diagnose the right person that could uh, go across the, the, then the treatment pathway is the best approach right now. It's the most urgent uh, approach. Uh, even before blood, uh, which uh, we all see as a, a good option uh, to rule out the patients that uh, eventually uh, won't be eligible for uh, new disease modifiers. Uh, but uh, today we have great tools, uh, which are PET, CSF. Uh, so what we need to do and what needs to happen is to ensure that that diagnostic pathway is uh, as uh, uh, fast and accurate as possible so that patients uh, uh, will be, uh, the right patients will be addressed to the right treatment uh, when uh, they will become available. So the urgent uh, step here, um, and I guess uh, this will uh, um, manage the expectations, uh, as uh, as we were saying, is definitely uh, ensure and urge the healthcare systems to equip um, the uh, centers and the uh, HCPs with the right tools, um, with, the, with the right access uh, to, um, to those tools. Uh, for an accurate diagnosis. Yeah, uh, Jad, to follow up on that, do you, in uh, this thing of finding the right patients, for example, do you have tools for that or the right tools in the joint national process that you described earlier, or is that an area for development? Uh, we have been working that way for other diseases, and um, I believe that uh, a stepwise introduction is the way forward. And we have been working with um, specialists in the fields previously in, with other recommendations. And then we have recommendations that um, define the patient that uh, are most in need and will benefit most for the treatments and have uh, more detailed recommendations and also uh, both inclusion and exclusion criteria. And also if you, it's important part to uh, give the support for the healthcare when they need to stop the treatment when it hasn't any effect anymore. So um, this is a way 
to to manage an or an a, a reintroduction that is sustainable for the healthcare system and for the clinics and for the patients too because the patients are most in need and that uh, have most um, effect of the treatment will have it first but uh, that of course it's difficult for those who have to wait i i realize that but mm. it's a way forward in a way mm. and um Yes, um, and I think we can get this cooperation and collaboration with our clinics and our specialists, and they can help us with the register, the quality register and follow up through their data. Thanks, and Lina, it, uh, so you and other politicians, you're facing some really, really hard issues right now, and we're talking about things that needs development over a long time. And we talk a lot now about managing society's expectation and things like that. Is it even possible for politicians to prioritize and put the light on issues like this uh, in these times, in these trying times? Well, of course there are trying times. Uh, we have an economic winter all over the world, more or less right now. Um, but I have to be a bit optimistic and say that I mean, it's never been as good as now either. I mean, we stand on the shoulders of giants. In my hometown, uh, the hospital a few hundred, hundred years ago, there were, there, were, there were mostly priests employed because people died. So what they needed was a, a calm last time. Uh, so of course we have, I mean, we have a trying time now, but we also have possibilities to do things. Uh, and I, I agree with the worry about meeting expectations but i i think the biggest problem with meeting expectations mm -hmm. are healthy people like myself uh, demanding immediate need satisfaction so mm -hmm. i think that when we look at what we can afford to do i think we need to look at the entire population um at least in sweden mm -hmm. and see where are all these people who actually don't even need health care and how can we help them in another way not in in healthcare, um, and and that's where the priorities come in again. I mean, there there are things that we should not do, uh, and one of them is not to to not treat progressive deadly illnesses. So, but um, I, I'm optimistic. It's never been as good as now. We can solve these problems. Right, two optimists. Uh, Kai, I'm going to let you. You have raised your hands. Uh, your your hand. Oh, you also uh, yes, uh, I. I have a comment or a question to um, the panel. Uh, so, I mean, if, if we talk about uh, who will benefit best from the treatment, uh, what we know as far as I have read at least is that it's if you are between 50 and 90 years, if you have uh, MCI caused by Alzheimer's disease or mild dementia called by Alzheimer's disease and then that you are amyloid positive, period. That's what we know. And how, how could we possibly make a selection about who will benefit the, no, the best that I don't understand or that we sh should select patients that we should start the treatment on. And so, so, so my final question or my real question is that isn't the, the patient important here, that the patient has uh, the right, according to Swedish law, as we heard by MUA, and I guess it's the same in, in most European countries, that uh, healthcare should be equal. So if you have these criteria, very simple, then you should have a right to treatment. And we as doctors cannot really say so much. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, Giovanni, do you want to uh, give an answer to Kai first? I, I can try. Yes, uh, indeed, the uh, the criteria that were uh, based on uh, on the clinical trial results are can be summarized as you as you have uh, as you have detailed. However, in the clinical practice. Uh, there's a, a number of additional uh, considerations that you want to inject in your 
mm -hmm. uh, in the choice of uh, selecting someone for, for treatment. Uh, for instance, uh, well, the main, first and foremost, the risk of adverse events, uh, mm -hmm. anticoagulation, physical health, poor physical health and quality of life. The expectation of what does it, what does it mean for that patient half a point of, of a clinical dementia rating in 18 months. To some patients, it may mean a lot in terms of, the, of their overall quality of life. To other patients with, who already have a low quality of life, half a point of CDR summer box in 18 months is nothing. It's a drop in the sea. So uh, th that's one, one, one thing. The other thing is that the clinical trial, uh, there's a subgroup analysis that I'm sure, I'm sure you, you, you know. There are subgroup analysis. They have limited value, of course, because they're post hoc analysis, but they can be used to direct in, when, when you have a limited amount of resources and you have to make choices, one can use those, hmm. uh, the, the, the results of the subgroup analysis to direct your, uh, your choices. Hmm. Thank you. Again, I want to thank all panelists and all participants and the whole audience uh, for taking part in this morning's uh, uh, discussion and webinar. And uh, Frederick, you have one or two minutes to round up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, on behalf of BBC, I would like to equally thank uh, all contributors to today's event. Uh, particularly all the speakers, all of you uh, in the audience who have actually uh, actively contributed questions, but also to you, uh, Joachim, for uh, playing the role of Master of Ceremony so, so beautifully, and to you and colleagues uh, in Sweden who have uh, worked with us so intensely in putting all of this to, together. Um, I was personally very, very uh, enthusiastic hearing uh, the contribution from, uh, from the different panelists today. Um, particularly as we realized we are at the dawn of a revolution or we are probably with a, a, a revolution already in motion that is pervasive, that is likely to take time, but that actually requires all of us to look, to look for improvements and change uh, in the way we are currently organizing, uh, particularly diagnostic and det detection of Alzheimer uh, today. Um, but more importantly is that there are people um, actually behind all of these words and all of these concepts, um, patients, their families, their carers, um, nurses, GPs, and specialists. Um, these people actually require trust and they require an enabling environment in order to be able to uh, to deliver and uh, and benefit from, from those improvements. So the work ahead of us actually continues uh, to be able to to engage policymakers, it was great to have uh, someone like Lina um, uh, with us today. Um, but we'd like to to really invite everyone to stay tuned uh, to the further work that we are going to do uh, on behalf of EBC, but also with partners like the Young Fund in in Sweden and in other countries. Um, in our agenda, we have one event uh, to which we'd like to invite all of you. It's the Brain Innovation Days, end of October. This is the kind of discussion that we would like to have and that we will have uh, in this context. So really to advance uh, the agenda, it would be uh, the best way to do this. So um, you're all invited to, uh, to join. And from our perspective, we'd like to thank everyone once again for having joined. Um, and we look forward to carry on the discussion. Thank you very much and have a great day.